all you people uh, that managed came here. I know that Greece is far away from most of you. Uh, welcome Thessaloniki, first of all. We finally made it. After nine months, we finally made it. And I'm still standing. That's very important. So uh, some uh, information that uh, I would like you to know. It's, uh, well, if you need help, there are people with blue shirts like mine uh, that can help you do everything. Hmm. Almost everything. OK. <laughs> uh, you ha we have a beach bar outside uh, where you can spend your Giko money. Uh, the thing with Giko money is that uh, you donate to the project, and uh, once you donate uh, 50 cents, you get 1,000 Giko dollars, and uh, then you can spend it on the bar. But usually you have to have 2,000 Giko dollars because with 1,000 Giko dollars you only get the refreshments, and <laughs> most of you don't drink refreshments as far as I know. <laughs> so. Uh, I hope that uh, you will have a great time. So, welcome to Open Source Conference 2013. <laughs> this is wha where Susa money is spent. <laughs> So, uh, you, yeah, I, f I forgot the parties. What, for once, I forgot the parties. Hey, let's go to Spagat. So, I forgot the part. I forgot to mention the parties, and it's the first time in my life that I forgot to mention any parties. So. Uh, have in mind that uh, today it's a free day. If you would like, you can uh, sit around and have a repeat of what we did yesterday. Uh, tomorrow we will have a SUSE sponsored party near. It's actually the next door from the museum, the place that we will have the party. And uh, on Sunday we have a volunteers cocktail party where we will be at a cocktail uh, bar and have cocktails and it will be the volunteers' day, actually. So uh, come join the volunteers that did all that hard work to get all this done. OK. Uh, I have uh, many people that I would like to thank, but I would, look, I would do it on my speech, because there, we don't have enough time to do that. So ladies and gentlemen, your griefs. Um, yeah, the, unfortunately, uh, other than that, it's truly all Greek to me. But um, good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for being here. Thanks to our hosts for organizing this event. Um, quite a few of us have been here for a few uh, days already. And um, I guess that's for the recording. Um, and um, have experienced uh, the, the famous Greek hospitality and much enjoyed it, so thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the invitation to uh, allow me to try to open this. I'll do my very best. So welcome to the convention of superheroes. Um, I see mostly superheroes in the room right now, but um, it's actually at the point now that people apparently make us into action figures. Um, yes, I was surprised too. Um, but I brought proof. Uh, uh, uh. Let me fix that.
I suspect perhaps that is not necessarily um, only about us, but um, thanks to uh, uh, recent events, I've actually decided to give um, the whole PRISM disclosures quite the uh, coverage in here because I believe this is perhaps one of the most important moments for us as a community in sense of public awareness and um, adoption of um, the things we do. Um, why is that? Well, first of all, I mean, in case you have spent the past weeks under a rock, um, PRISM is the name of a secret NSA program uh, that has been disclosed by a whistleblower named Edward Snowden. And um, he is uh, currently fleeing from the US government, which wasn't all that happy about this um, disclosure. And somehow this triggered a, ho a whole avalanche of disclosures um, related to this, which I'll all summarize under PRISM anyway, because um, ultimately now the um, experience um, that we've made is we learn almost every day something else about what has been going on in terms of governmental surveillance of the internet. Um, and most importantly, of people somehow using the internet, which actually, well, is virtually anyone all the time since we are all the time connected, all of us carry mobile phones with us, and we leave data traces wherever we go, only that people thought mistakenly that, you know, in all that data, you know, the little trail that I'm making, no one could ever follow that, right? It's so much data, how could you do that? Um, people apparently were thinking a little bit in the sense of, if I see all this data, I could never make sense of it. I could never I find that one trail from that one person to tell where they have been. Well, guess what? There's automated systems to do that, and they do that very, very well. So PRISM actually enables the US government, but also other governments, um, and the UK has its own Tempora program, which is um, quite down the same lane. Um, it's a surveillance that is constantly ongoing of the cloud, so all the cloud services that are being used, be it Google, be it Office 369, be it whatever, um, all of those cloud services are tapped into, all of them. And in fact, when you look at the legal situation here, those companies have to comply. They must provide access. Um, but it's also about software. In particular, Microsoft um, has been actively colluding with the NSA, um, also most likely not fully voluntarily, but they have been very cooperative, apparently, in making sure that the NSA always knew before anyone else about certain exploits that gets you into the operating system, um, which more or less equates to the famous Windows Microsoft backdoor. Um, different mechanism, technically speaking, but in its workings, quite the same, meaning the NSA can, in an automated way, break into virtually any Windows box in the world whenever they do ch so choose. What is so concerning about this? I mean, okay, so I think most people would agree that governments need some way of tapping into information. Um, I mean, there is legitimate cases, I guess, that we would agree to in the sense of there's an actual crime being committed and a judge has signed off on a warrant to say, all right, this particular person, we think they're up to something bad for all these reasons and a judge then decides whether or not the investigator has actually made a sufficiently strong case to allow some form of surveillance. This mechanism has been working in different countries for a while and more or less good depending on the country. Nonetheless, that mechanism per se exists and probably should exist. However, this is a different thing. This is everyone all the time and without a warrant. And that last part, 
is probably the most important. I mean, most of the dis discussion that you're currently seeing is the big tech companies trying to say, oh, but it's all been under warrant and so on and so forth. You know, it, 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 and they're trying now to be able to disclose what they had to disclose under warrant. But none of that, I mean, it's actually nicely distracting from the actual issue, which is there's been warrantless access in the US, which means no judge has ever seen this. There is some guy somewhere, just a small analyst at a terminal saying, you know, oh, I would really like to know what this person is up to, and has access to this entire program, according to what Edward Snowden told us, and we have no reason to disbelieve this, and just pull that information which might actually be as simple in the usability as a Google search. Um, and you get the whole trace of that person through all the systems. Um, and you can then set filters to make this active surveillance as well. That is concerning. And while immediately one would think this must be illegal, I mean, there's no way that, it, that you know, this should be legal ever. The interesting part here is it's fully legal. Um, the United States have legislation in place, um, most importantly the FISA, the Foreign Intel Intelligence Surveillance Act, um, that actually makes this fully legal. And it makes this fully legal not just for the purpose that is typically being fronted as the, the main purpose, which is, you know, terrorism. Um, we need this to fight terrorists. Maybe we do. It's hard to tell since no one really has any actual hard evidence on what exactly is going on there. And the surveillance even within the democratic apparatus seems to be extremely lacking. But most importantly, actually, FISA makes it legal for the US to do this for political and economic goals. In other words, to manipulate political process internationally and in any country outside the US and have economic interference in the sense of we really prefer that Boeing gets that um, deal and not Airbus. So let's see what we can find out. And that's legal. I mean, it's entirely legal. That is what the law says is allowed to do. Now, there's an obvious point here that quite a few countries are now saying, oh, but you know, how can this be? We are friends, um, you know. But frankly, um, this is what the United States call realpolitik. Um, and I find it oddly ironic that the Germans are the ones who are the most surprised by it. Um, but all of this is, is fully documented and referenced by now. And in particular, I would highlight a presentation that Kaspar Bowden gave because um, he took a part very well. He used to work for Microsoft, by the way. Um, he took apart very well how FISA empowers this kind of activity. Um, and now there's even disclosures that perhaps this has been going on at the NATO level. Um, so, you know, there's all sorts of questions still open. New disclosures are still coming. So we don't still know the entire extent of it. But of course, what this has created is a very, very strong feeling of big brother watching you. Um, that is the feeling that a lot of people instantaneously and very strongly got, and I think that has a certain reason. I mean, I can see why that is. Now, in theory, the U.S. program is not supposed to target people on U.S. soil. Um, so in, in, if you live in the U.S., you should allegedly be safe unless you communicate with someone from outside the U.S. Um, that's the one limitation of the system. Um, but even that, quite a few U.S. citizens uh, are not quite so convinced about and are very concerned about. So we do have a, um, a momentum where suddenly all of this, and I mean, this isn't really all that new. That's the exciting part. I mean, it's, we've known about quite a few of the activities. We've known about Echelon for quite a while. I mean, initially also labeled a conspiracy theory. But, you know, we've known about these things for a while, but somehow they never made the mainstream media. Well, now they do, um, for the very first time. So first of all, I mean, just to get it off our collective chest, right? Because we knew about this. Um, everyone who's been in technology deep enough actually, you know, 
knew that quite a bit of this was going on. Um, if you were at all in any security um, context, typically, yes, you would know. Um, so we told you so. Um, you know, no one was willing to listen. But what's more important is we as a community told people that it is essential to take control of their own IT. We said it's important that you have control over all the software around you. And people always said, ah, it's not that important. You know, what's the threat scenario? You know, nah, the government couldn't do that, wouldn't do that. Well, now, yeah, I know I like that one. We actually find ourselves in the cultural mainstream. And that is actually quite important. This is another third. I think we need, we need to sit back for a second and realize suddenly we find our issues in the mainstream. While we have been, you know, as a community, very strong um, talking with each other and also talking with interested parties outside our community, all of a sudden the very questions that we have been raising for the past 20, 30 years have become questions that are asked on a broader level by more people by communities outside our own. And to me, that is one of the most important revelations of the whole prism um, debate. Because suddenly people realize that computers are power. Um, I mean, you see politicians actually standing up and saying, wait a minute, if you can actually read all my email. That makes it very hard for me to negotiate with you on, say, a free trade agreement. Um, you know, there's a certain uh, problem here because you know exactly how far I am willing to go. You know exactly where my cutoff point is. You can push me always, all the way to the max. It's an unbelievable advantage. And I also be believe, actually, that this is going to be quite interesting in, sense, in the sense of the global power structure. And so far, as countries from the South, which are not traditionally um, involved in this program, suddenly have to realize the level at which their information has been leaking. Because information ultimately is power. If you have that information, if you know what the other party is, is planning, thinking, what they're willing to do or not do, where is their red line, what is their main interest actually in that negotiation, if you know all of this by the time you're sitting in a room with them, if you hear what they're discussing with their embassy, with their you know, home base to see whether the minister agrees or not, that gives you a major advantage. So now suddenly the whole question of how to take control of our own infrastructure, how to take control over the technology that we require, that we depend upon by now, has become absolutely topical for virtually anyone, including also businesses. I mean, business secrets are for a very good reason secret, typically. Um, you don't necessarily want your competitor to know that you're right now negotiating that business deal. It's not good policy. You wouldn't want them to be able to read what you have just offered to the customer so they can either up their offer or lower the price or do whatever. And if there is enough incentive in there, yes, it can happen. We now, we now know that. So the question really becomes for quite a few businesses, how do I ensure that actually I am not vulnerable to this kind of behavior. And this really brings us back to the basics of software freedom. I mean, ultimately, 
code is law was a very, very nice summary by Lawrence Lessig. And law is always codified power. And if by better access to technology, by better access to information, I have more ability to codify my advantage in information into international law, by the way, that gives me a rather major advantage. And one that should be of a greater concern for quite a few people. So it brings us back to the basics of software freedom, really. I mean, these are the principles that we live by. Use, study, share, improve. Those are the four freedoms that make our community, that allow us to collaborate and that allow us to collectively, but also individually, take control of technology. We've had the answer to this all along. I mean, this is actually the answer to the entire question of what to do about technology when this kind of global surveillance is going on when countries are, of course, trying to protect their own interests. What you want to do then is you want to protect your own and actually make sure that you take control. And this allows you to do that. So effectively, I think that uh, the NSA is right now helping us in a way that no one ever has to tell people why it is important to take control of your own systems. Because before when you said yes, but someone could go into your computer and could actually you know, take all that information, you know, pull that data out and use it for their advantage, people were always saying, yeah, but that's a hypothetical scenario. No one's ever done that. You know, show me the public evidence. Um, well, we have it now. So in terms of creating the motivation to migrate to open source, this is perhaps the biggest boost that we have ever gotten. I mean, it makes the case on all levels, individuals, businesses, and governments, in a way like nothing before actually has. Um, because it demonstrates that many of the scenarios that before were considered theoretical are actually real, which is fairly interesting. And sites like this um, prison break .org site have quite the momentum. They have a substantial amount of traffic. And traffic from people who never ever came in touch with us before, who now say, this goes beyond what I'm willing to accept. This is not the society I want to be a part of. And people are now starting to vote with their feet and are trying out free software, are trying out open source on a scale that I don't think has existed before. So I think we now have a pivotal moment as a community where we actually have the attention. We actually have the attention of virtually anyone who's following the media. And I think we should use that attention. I think we should use that moment and explain to people what we have been working on and why. So the motivation is clearly there. In order to make sure that everyone then also uses our software, we need to give them the opportunity, right? We need to make sure that they actually can. And uh, it was actually Jos who pointed out to me that um, the um, background here is uh, the veil of ignorance. We all are typically fairly technical, which means we feel very comfortable around technology. Um, all of us, I assume, are unafraid of the shell. You know, we all like text. 
um, we can all type. That's all fantastic, but not everyone has that level of knowledge or information or even the inclination to, um, to do things um, in a technical way. What about the people who are not technical and who don't really want to be technical because they need to be something else? They need to be surgeons, they need to be lawyers, they need to be whatever else. I mean, as a society, we function because we specialized. Um, not one person can do everything equally really well. We will not succeed as a society if everyone has to do everything, right? I mean, we've, we've evolved to this level because we took certain parts in society and we took the job that we can do well and did it well, hopefully. Um, and so we are, the, we are the, the tech guys. We are the people who can make computers work. But not necessarily everyone is in that situation. And the question that I'm asking myself is, um, and that's actually the veil of ignorance, is if I was you know, thrown into this world again with perhaps a different skill set, would I still be able to make use of these technologies in the same way? And I think the answer, the honest answer for us right now still is perhaps. Um, I think we still have to do more to make it easy for people to use the software we make. We have to think as a community about the fact that we don't just write software, at least I don't. I mean, for me, the software is not a goal in and of itself. I know some people see it different. But I think that software derives its value from being used from helping someone. That, that is what motivates me, at least, um, to get up in the morning because I have the feeling I can do something that will help other people get a job done in a better way, you know, have some fun perhaps, who knows, but something that interacts with other human beings. For me, that's actually important. And so we have to understand that there is a long chain between the person who is writing the source code and all the way at the end, a person who is then using this on their computer. Um, it's not like you know, the, the, uh, the code would magically appear on the other end and that person would know how to use it. It would be usable, fantastic software. You know, it would look fantastic, so it's fun to use. Um, there is a long, long chain in there. And um, I stole this concept here. Um, this is the, called the chain of survival. I think what we need to build for ourselves as a mental model is something like a chain to adoption. Um, and it needs to include a whole lot more people. It needs to include developers, of course. I mean, without people who write the code, it's like kind of pointless. Um, but we also need people who write the documentation, users. We need our beta testers. We need everyone who's part of a proper um, cycle. We need support. We need entrepreneurs, managers, politicians even, decision makers. We need designers. We need artists. We need them all. Because at the end of the day, I mean, you can write the best piece of software ever ex in existence on this planet. If there is no support structure in place where say, a government can actually get its support when it needs it, where a big company can go to say, I really, really, really have this problem here. I need someone to help me out with it. If that professional side of the equation does not exist, they can never use it. Because, of course, I mean, we all know code breaks, right? Software always has problems. Software never does every job perfectly well immediately. So it's all about the support structure around it. So as a community, I think we need to understand that this whole picture is important. And I think we have made huge progress. I mean, we've made massive progress in the sense of professionalizing ourselves in the structures from development to bringing it into the hands of users. But I still think that we need to look a little bit more sometimes at the uh, connection between the developers 
and the enterprise. And that's a constant balance, right? We're constantly struggling with getting that balance right. I mean, I know that, you know, Zuse and OpenZuse, but also Fedora and RHEL, I mean, to just to name the two very big visible examples, um, but they exist in smaller scales as well. It's a constant adjustment, trying to work hand in hand to make sure that you can actually get what someone wrote into the hands of the user, because frankly, most developers don't even like to interact with users. Um, I mean, most developers I know hate support calls. Um, so, I mean, as a developer, typically one should be very, very happy about having the support structure in the middle. But for me, um, I think that is where we still need to improve because we're still not quite up to the same level than some other companies have done this in the past. Um, not in every aspect. I mean, obviously we have in quite a few areas um, that capability down to the T. But I think in particular, and yes, I'm going to say the D word, in particular on the desktop, um, we need to actually push a little bit further. Um, because we can. It's not the technology anymore. It's no longer the technology. It's also in the whole business structure around it. It's in the entire chain from where do we enter the chain to the customer. That is where we now also need to focus our attention. But in the end, I think the main message here is that it actually takes everyone. It takes the suits, and I dressed myself up for you know, giving a proper keynote, actually. And it takes the people um, at the keyboard hacking in the code. This is a community, and it's a community of values whose values have now actually made the headlines. So, in that sense, I am actually very proud to be part of this community. And I was very happy to be in Prague, as I am now very happy to be here. And so, enjoy the conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>